You were taught it at school. You've been brought up to believe it. So it must be true. I'm talking about evolution. Remember from ape to man or how fish entered land, grew legs, breathed air for the first time, acquired hair and so on. And the all elusive missing link. In this video, I'm going to show you the facts. But don't have a go at me. You may not like what you see in here. But believe me, it's fact. Welcome to the third episode in the Alternative View series, Evolution, Yet More Lies. Let me quote you Charles Darwin, you know, the 19th century naturalist and biologist. The love for all living creatures is the most noble attribute of man. I agree, and a very noble statement too. But some say that Darwin's works on evolution are nothing but made up tosh and in truth, just a theory. It is, in fact, just a theory, and he himself did not deny that. I mean, his 1859 book titled On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection is often referred to in the academic circles as the theory of evolution. Let's dive in and see if it is just a theory, or if indeed it is factually correct. Just after Christmas, December the 27th, 1831 to be exact, Charles Darwin set off on an incredible journey aboard the ship HMS Beagle. His journey would take almost five years to complete. The Beagle was primarily a survey ship tasked with charting the coasts of South America and conducting scientific exploration. Darwin joined as the ship's naturalist, though his role was unofficial. It turned out to be a pivotal event in the history of science, shaping his ideas about evolution and natural selection. Darwin was 22 years old when the voyage began, and it profoundly influenced his thinking, providing the observations and later led to his theory of evolution and a change in how the world looked at the human and other animals. Darwin joined Captain Robert Fitzroy, the captain of the Beagle. The young naturalist kept detailed journals and collected samples from the very start. He explored the rainforests of Brazil, he collected animal remains from the Pampas in Argentina and even witnessed the aftermath of an earthquake in Chile while studying the wildlife on and around the Andes mountains. Four years into the journey, they came across the Galapagos Islands. These islands are home to some of the most unique wildlife on Earth. He studied the beak sizes of finches and the shell shapes of the Galapagos tortoise. Australia came next and Darwin was fascinated by not only the diverse foliage the country had to offer, but the peculiar animals it accommodated, like the kangaroo and the duckbill platypus. This challenged the prevailing ideas of fixed natural order. Now, whether or not Darwin was told to or coerced into this, it also challenged the ideas of a creator or a god. If Darwin's ideas were to become gospel, excuse the pun, then he would prove there was no God and Christianity was a false belief. Now, is that what all this was about? After nearly five years, Darwin returned with a wealth of specimens, notes and observations that would occupy him for decades. He had all the knowledge to write a book and that book was going to be On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection, one of the most famous books ever written. But here comes the first deception. See, although Darwin had spent all that time exploring and collecting specimens, the book, a book that he's so renowned for, and documentation can back this up, he popularised the idea by borrowing it from several others, including the zoologist Edward Blythe. You can look up copies of his work in the magazine of Natural History from 1835 and 1837. It's available online in PDF form. In it, are several articles by Blythe describing the process of natural selection. Strange, because Darwin hadn't returned from his five-year Beagle exploration until 1836, and then took another 20-odd years to write his works. Blythe's work was published near on 20 years before Darwin's science changing on the origins of species. What else throws up suspicion is that it is known that Darwin owned copies of Blythe's work. 
a book by Lauren Isley called Darwin and the Mysterious Mr. X, written in 1979, I think, suggests that some of Darwin's works read too close to Blythe's papers. Since that book, Isley has been criticised by many in the science community. Prior to this, though, Dr. Isley, a PhD in anthropology, was regarded as a great scholar within the evolutionary community. Does Darwin's natural selection theory exist? Or was Charles Darwin doing some selection of his own? When someone criticises the works and theories of Darwin, the first thing that happens is that you are regarded as a conspiracy theorist. That's okay by me. Facts are facts. And if no one wants to listen to the facts, then that's up to them. But once again, why is there no sensible discord or debate when it comes to something like evolution? It seems to me that once taught something and then them teachings become questionable, it is hard for folk to change their mind, to look at it from another angle. When you question a proper evolutionist, and there are several, they give you 100% proof examples of evolution by natural selection at work. Here are the two most common. First is the Hykagani crab, or commonly known as the samurai crab. They are called a samurai crab because some of the crab have a pattern that of a samurai face on the shell. Fishermen in Japan, when out crab fishing, will throw back any Hykagani crab that bears the samurai face. It's a tradition. Evolutionists have studied and stated that more and more of the Hykagani crab now have the samurai pattern on their shells. They say that this is due to natural selection and survival of the fittest. They think that the crabs are evolving in such a way that they actually recognise that ones with the samurai face pattern are surviving. Thus, evolution is taking hold for them to survive. A few problems in the theory that they don't tell you, though, is that the crabs are so small, about an inch and a half in diameter, that the fishermen throw them all back anyhow. And two, the Hykagani crab was walking the earth way before any samurai. What I'm saying is that possibly the evolutionists are adamant that these stories or theories will convince folk that evolution is a thing. But surely if evolution was real, they won't need to carry on with such theories that even they know won't or can't hold up. Another is the example of the peppered moth. Now it changed its camouflage due to the Industrial Revolution. And it's been referred to adamantly by evolutionists. And not only the icon of Darwinian evolution, but also the piece de resistance in terms of evidence of evolution. And it's the example used to convert students on academic courses relating to evolution. That is until all sorts of, how shall we say, dishonesty surrounding how these studies and experiments involving the peppered moth were conducted and was exposed. The majority of the supposed proof of the evolution of the pepper moth, provided by Dr. Bernard Ketterwell from Oxford University, was also full of deception and false advertising, if you will. Ketterwell's work had been known to be suspect. He had even glued some of the moths to the tree trunks because it was known during the experiments that it wasn't the pepper moth's natural habitat and it would just fly away. Their example of evolution implies instances of directional colour change in the moth population as a consequence of the air pollution during the Industrial Revolution. They say before the Industrial Revolution, the peppered moth was light in colour. But now, through natural selection, the moth's DNA had somehow changed the moth's colour to a dark brown due to the pollution in the air, so it can remain camouflage. And when the industry slowed and the air got a bit cleaner, the moth reverted back to its lighter colour. It was proven to be a fraudulent example as dead moths were used and the species always had the two colours. Yet this example is still put in ink for the textbooks to this day. The trouble is with evolutionists or other folk who believe in the concept of Darwinism is the fact that whenever an example is exposed, they just move on to the next one until that one is exposed and so on. Survival of the fittest, I suppose. I don't know about you, but I find myself asking the question, why do they need to lie and submit false examples if evolution is a no-brainer. But that isn't the end of the lies. Far from it. Probably the biggest fraudulent example is that of German Ernst Haeckel. He promoted the theories of Darwin in Germany before developing his own theory. 
Don't worry, I'm not going to go all big words on you. But this theory promotes embryos in the womb. He concocted an illustration of eight different vertebrates in three different stages of embryonic state. His theory in general was that all vertebrates start off the same, but diverge during growth. This was supposed to be the proof of evolution. He theorized that the human embryo started off with gills like a fish and a tail like a monkey, etc. Reinforcing the idea that the human being is just an evolved animal from other animals. You start life in the womb like a worm, then become more like a fish, then become an ape-like animal, and finally what you are now. And all this growing in your mother. It is absolutely ridiculous. It went on to suggest that fish, salamander, turtles, pigs, rabbits, cows, and humans all share a common ancestor. This was false. Ernst Heuchel was prosecuted for fraud. To think that these illustrations were once used in our textbooks until just around 20 years ago is staggering, even though the scientists knew he had been prosecuted in the 1800s. They are trying to teach our kids and others BS. It was once thought that we, humans, and this is down to a supposed evolution again, had junk DNA. What do you mean, Bo? What's junk DNA? Evolutionists or Darwinians told us that body parts like tonsils or the appendix or adenoids, a total of 86 body parts actually, were deemed useless to the human body. Not only has now been quashed by biologists, but proven that some are of extreme importance. How wrong can you get? And all this just to try and prove a point that is now stacking up to be so wrong. The most convincing part of the evolution theory is that of Neanderthal man. They tell us that we were born of apes, some kind of evolutionary ancestor, a certain ape that is now extinct, apparently. They say there is a missing link, but they can't find it. They want you to believe this ape man theory so much that, yes, you've guessed it, they are willing to lie and believe fraudsters to just convince you. Neanderthal man had already been declared a full human by a professional anatomist. What I'm trying to say is that Neanderthal man, you know the caveman grunts and rubs sticks together, is 100% human, not half ape, half human. However, the release of Darwin's book fueled the search for fossils of this imagined ape-like ancestor. And lo and behold, four years after Darwin's book release, Irish geologist William King decided to re-examine the once false skull of Neanderthal man and promptly decided that he was an ape-like creature. This was perceived as science and fact for well over 150 years afterwards. Today, evolutionists call them Homo sapiens or Homo sapiens or Homo erectus, as in Homo, which means human. Even I can work out that humans evolving into humans isn't exactly proof of evolution, is it? In 1912, some truly impressive fossil evidence was found in a gravel pit near Piltdown in East Sussex, England. The skull of an ancient ape man, cleverly named Piltdown Man, was presented as definitive proof of our evolutionary ancestors. And for 40 whole years, this supposed proof was displayed in museum exhibits and in textbooks as proof that human beings had descended from the ape. Hand-drawn scientific images of what the man must have looked like were put out there to the public. But once again, four decades later, the evidence was re-examined and revealed as a fraud. It wasn't even a good fraud, as you could easily see how the teeth from a jawbone had been filed down to make them look more human, and the bones had been chemically treated to make them look very, very old. It was quite simply a mixture of an old human skull and a modern ape jawbone stuck together. Pathetic, to say the least. Yet another fraud exposed. Five years later, in 1917, in the United States, they found some conclusive evidence for evolution, and a Nebraskan rancher found what he thought was a special kind of tooth on his farm. And a paleontologist friend of his, who happened to be a Darwin believer, was excited at the prospect it must have come from the ape man. Hmm? Here we go again. After an artist applied some imaginary nouse to his picture, he produced a portrait of Nebraska man, 
another well thought up title. He was, or used to be, a hairy ape-like man. This was another astounding scientific proof of evolution, all from a single tooth. Wow. However, several years later, scientists confirmed that the tooth had come from, go on, have a guess, pick any animal. Anyone? Anyone? Pick an animal? A pig. <coughs> Yet more false conclusions. When one crawls under the fraud rock, another pokes its ugly head out. And they think it's going to fall, folk beats me, but it does. All animals, all species, all families have slight differences in their adopted categories. Ignore an identical twins for a minute. Sorry if any are watching. But then again, even you have differences. All siblings are slight variations. That doesn't mean it's evolution. Your son or daughter isn't going to suddenly grow extra long arms because dad put the kitchen cabinets up too high. Mind you, just because evolutionists falsely persuade folk to believe them in order to promote the theory, normally to disprove God, I must add, some questions about evolution are left unanswered and remain a total mystery. Take the hundredth monkey scenario. Between 1952 and 1953, primatologists, that's a study of primates to me and you, conducted a study of a troop of Japanese snow monkeys on the island of Kojima. It was initially to study their behaviour in differing circumstances. The researchers would supply these monkeys with food, like sweet potatoes. They'd scatter them on the beaches for monkeys to find. The unanticipated byproduct of the story was that the scientists witnessed several behavioural changes by the monkeys, two of which were orchestrated by one young female and one by her sibling. What they witnessed from the monkeys spread into a phenomenon, now called the hundredth monkey effect. The scientists observed that some of the monkeys, without being shown, learned to wash the sweet potatoes, all starting from an 18-month-old female member of the troop they called Imo. Imo discovered that sand and grit could be removed from the sweet potatoes by washing them in a stream or sometimes in the ocean. Gradually, this new potato washing habit spread through the island of the monkeys in the usual fashion through observation and repetition. Unlike most food customs within monkeys, this potato washing was learned by the older generation of monkeys from the younger ones. This behaviour spread through the troop until 1958, when a sort of group consciousness suddenly developed amongst the monkeys, as a result of just one monkey learning potato washing by conventional means. It was concluded that once a critical number of monkeys had learned the process of washing the potatoes, the hundredth monkey, this previously learned behaviour instantly spread across the water to monkeys on a nearby island. None other monkeys moved to the island. None had any contact whatsoever with any other monkey on any other island. So no contact had been made and no monkey could see across to the other islands. Yet all of the other monkeys, all the monkey species on all the islands were now washing the sweet potatoes. Very strange. But there must be an answer. Is that what evolution is? So is Charles Darwin legit? Is his tree of life an actual fact of life? Should we wait for the next fraudster to try and convince us of the theory of evolution? Or is evolution a real concept? You be the judge. Thanks again for watching. Please don't forget, tap that like button if you enjoyed it so that more people get the chance to see it. Plus, if you're not subscribed, consider subscribing, please, to the channel. It's free. I'd love to know what you think of evolution, so leave a comment below. I get some great comments when YouTube can be bothered to show them, and some great views on the subjects. Am I wrong about evolution? Does it exist? Maybe I should care more about apples than I do about origins. Take care, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.